Module 5, Conventional, Insured, and Guaranteed Loans. As we talked about in the earlier chapter, we talked about selling loans into the secondary market. And that's what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are for. They're government-sponsored enterprises that buy loans in the secondary market. So a lender can close a pool of loans and sell them directly to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac as long as they are conforming to Fannie and Freddie Mac's guidelines. And that's a term you probably should become aware of is if something is conforming to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they call it a conforming loan. We're also talking about government loans and government loans are either insured or guaranteed by that entity. For example, FHA insures loans for the lender up to 100% of the value. So if somebody goes into foreclosure on an FHA loan, the, the uh, lender is made whole. Likewise, on a VA loan, they're guaranteed. The VA guarantees part of that loan. So if a veteran goes into foreclosure, then uh, the lender can, can recoup some of those guaranteed funds and then get that property into foreclosure. Conventional loans. Normally, conventional loans, you can have fixed rates, you can have adjustable rates. However, adjustables aren't that popular today. You can have different terms, whether that be 30 or 15 years, could be 20, 10 or 20 years also, different ranges. Likewise, for conventional loans, you can have different down payments. Could be 3% down, maybe it's a first time buyer program, 5%, 10%, 20% down or more. The thing to remember though is if you put less than 20% down on a piece of property, meaning you have a greater than an 80% loan to value, you'll have to pay private mortgage insurance. You can have temporary buy downs on loans, meaning if you have a note rate of say 7%, you could buy it down the first year 2% to bring it down to five, and then the next year a 1% to bring it down to six. So then you'd go five, six, and 7% not very common today in the market we have right now with low interest rates but you what you can do is discount interest rates for example and uh, if you have a note rate of three percent and it's costing you zero points somebody may decide to pay prepaid interest or one point up front and a point is one percent of the loan amount so if you're borrowing four hundred thousand dollars you're paying four thousand dollars to discount that note rate and you might bring it down to say two and three quarter percent. So the interest rates are negotiable depending on whether you want to pay points, get a rebate, or or just have a par rate at no points. Today, borrower's qualifications for a conforming loan, you have to have a qualified mortgage, meaning that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are looking for somebody that can support that mortgage. You need to be able to verify your income and assets to support that loan and that monthly payment. If it's not a conforming loan, and the key feature for that is if it's over the maximum loan amount for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, then you call it a jumbo or non-conforming loan. And those loans are a little bit harder to qualify for. Normally will require you to have some cash reserves after close of escrow also. Home equity loans allows the person to tap the equity on their property. And they're in the form of second trust deeds and those trustees can be fixed or adjustable, and a lot of them you can draw as you need. For example, you may go in and get a, a home equity loan on your property for $100,000, but as you close on that loan, it could be at a zero balance. But then as you have projects and you move forward, you can make draws against that equity line, normally in the form of a check. Today, as I said, Lenders are looking for qualified mortgages. However, there are some institutions out there that will have what's called non-QM or non-qualified mortgage loans. Normally when you see those, there'll be lower credit scores. There's options as far as income and assets. What, what some people will allow you to do to, to support your income instead of say pay stub and W-2 is to show 12 or 24 months bank statements to show income coming into your company. And normally that's for self-employed borrowers. Coming out of our mortgage crisis, here's a couple of terms that you should be aware of. One of them is called flipping. Uh, 
Flipping was frequently making new refinance loans, whether somebody needed it or not, thinking they'd get a better deal on the new loan amount. Lenders would flip them in and out of, say, adjustable rate mortgages and back into fixed rate mortgages just to make origination fees. Today, that term is a little different. When you hear flipping, you're probably looking at a contractor going in and buying uh, fixer-up properties and then uh, flipping them to a new borrower. Packing was a term they used to, when people would, uh, would unbeknownst to the, to the borrowers, add other products that benefited that lender. And normally that included uh, charging excessive fees and other products that people were unaware of, which is more difficult today because of the Dodd-Frank Dodd and RESPA Real Estate Settlement and Procedures Act, which says that you have to be aware of what your closing costs are. In fact, as you have your application originated, you need to have a disclosure given to the, the initial disclosure. Prior to close of escrow, you get another disclosure called your, your closing disclosure, which says what your actual closing costs are, which may be points, appraisal, credit report, escrow and title. And in today's market, they better match because if they don't, for example, and say a, a loan officer quoted you $400 for, for a processing fee, but then a close of escrow, that processing fee bumped to $600. Well, you can't do that in today's market. And if you want to close based on the $600 processing fee, then that lender is going to have to eat that and pay for it. So that's a closing disclosure. Very important today. It has to be up three days prior to closing your loan. New guidelines that came out to protect people against deceptive and unfair practices in home equity lending. Number one was the Home Equity Protection Act of 1994. And of course, Regulation Z came out, uh, which is part of the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, which discloses all of the expenses on a loan that a borrower uh, is expected to pay during a closing. And of course, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act and the Consumer Protection Act came out also to really ensure financial stability in the United States and uh, improving trans transparency in the financial system. And also what we're looking at as far as somebody getting a real estate home loan, if you're getting a loan, you should know what program you're getting into, whether it be fixed or adjustable, and also what expenses you be anticipated to pay at close of escrow, and that should not change during processing. In today's market too, we have, it, electronic real estate loan services, which means that as a borrower comes in in today's market, as opposed to the old days when you'd sit down physically and fill out a loan application for someone, which some people still do today, more, or not, more than not, people will fill out an application online through a secure system. And then what the loan officer will do at that point is take that application and underwrite it through a, an electronic system, either from Fannie Mae, which has desktop underwriter, or Freddie Mac, which has loan prospector, commonly called LP. Now, it still requires a signed application at time of origination, but also that can be done online also with electronic signatures. And once again, prior to close, three days prior to close, a CD or closing disclosure has to come out, which the borrower signed to say, yes, this is what I signed up for. These are the expenses. This is my interest rate, and I'm ready to close, and that's called a CD. FHA came into the market in 1934, and basically what FHA does is, is insures loans. They don't buy loans in the secondary market, but they insure loans to protect lenders. So lenders can grant long-term financing and with amortizing loans, meaning as I make my payment, a portion goes to the principal balance, and the rest goes to interest. They also set a standard for minimum property gut standards for properties. If an appraiser goes out and they see something that doesn't meet those minimum standards, they'll call it out on the appraisal and then has to be fixed prior to close of escrow. The applications and 
reporting documentation for income and assets has to go through a careful review. The appraisal, of course, is, is the appraiser is the appraisal is a bit more comprehensive than other reports, requiring the appraisers to go through and do a fairly extensive review of the property before issuing their value. FHA borrowers also are to receive some other documents to make sure they understand what they're getting into when they're buying a home. And one of those documents is for your protection, get a home inspection, which most people do prior to even getting their appraisal. Let's see the condition of this property before we move forward. And once again, the CD has to be out three days prior to close of escrow. FHA is not a direct lender. They're not a lender, but they're an insurer. So, and they'll insure up to 100% of the value. Now, being that you're getting insurance on this with FHA, you'll also have to pay for insurance. So you'll pay a monthly mortgage insurance and a close of escrow, you'll pay a monthly uh, a mortgage insurance premium. With FHA, it's a reduced down payment. The minimum down payment is 3.5%. FHA has really helped stabilize the mortgage market and comes in to help people that generally can't really qualify for a loan. They allow some things that most conventional programs do not. For example, you can get a 100% gift from a family member for your down payment and closing costs. So if you have 3.5% down payment and that's $7,000 and $4,000 in closing costs, you can get a gift from your parents or a family member to pay for that. They'll allow for lower credit scores. They'll also allow for a non-occupant co-signer, which other loans do not allow for or are very restrict restrictive on, meaning that if you can't really qualify for your property that you're purchasing, you can have your parents or a family member co-sign on the mortgage. And there's no restriction. That person does not have to live in the property. Whereas with other conventional programs, that person may have to live in the property with you if they're going to sign on the note. These are some popular FHA programs that are available to people. The most common is the FHA Section 203B, uh, which is a mortgage insured loan for a one to four family property. So one unit to a fourplex. This is another one that's very good, and I'm surprised it's not used much, the 203K loan. Because when you buy a resale property, I mean, minimum as you move in, you're going to need carpet, tile, paint, maybe replace cabinets. So that's cash you need. With a rehab or a 203K loan, you can include that in the price of your property. So it's a sales price plus the cost of your rehab. Then your 3.5% down goes in that total figure. What's also a nice incentive about this is that you arrange for this prior to closing and the work does not have to be completed till after prior to close. So you close on the property, the funds are escrowed for, escrowed for your rehab, and then within 30 days after close of escrow, you can start your, your rehab construction. For condominiums, that's called a 234C loan. Condos must be approved by FHA prior to close. Uh, I believe they're coming out with a new spot approval now too, but in, in, in most cases, the condo project has to be approved by FHA. FHA does have adjustable rate mortgages. That's called a 251 loans. They're actually not bad. Normally, they're 5-1 arms, meaning they're fixed for the first five years. And then after five years, they'll adjust annually. And they're pretty good programs. Other programs that FHA has, they have the Energy Efficient Mortgage, the EEM, which basically states that the cost of, of energy improvements to save on your energy payments can be included in your mortgage. So if you need to re, if you need to work on your heating or solar units, and that saves you and your energy efficiency, then uh, you can include those costs in the mortgage. There's also the home equity conversion mortgage, which you hear today is called a reverse mortgage for people over 62 years old. 
they have a program called a good neighbor next door or the officer next door where people or say policemen who live in a in a particular community can get a discount on the purchase price of the home fha also has home ownership vouchers commonly called section 8 which are credit for rents a person pays on a monthly basis they also have a program called native american housing section 184 in most cases on on tribal land it's trust land meaning the tribe owns the land and conventional programs shy away from trust land but fha will do it uh, alone on it on trust land in, in a tribe if certain situations apply meaning how long that trust is how long that person can be in the house fha will come in and lend in tribal communities section 184 The underwriting guidelines, once again, FHA is looking for qualified mortgages, and they do have a maximum loan limit, too, and that can increase whether it be a one unit, a duplex, triplex, or fourplex that can go up. They do the down payment requirements they're looking for. They have minimum standards for those. Borrower's income qualifications has to be verified. They're looking for regular and recurring income. They do look for debt to income ratios. And what they're looking at mainly is about a 41%. And that means this, my new house payment plus my bills, car payments, master charge, visa, divided by, by my gross monthly income should not exceed 41% of my gross monthly income. They, do, they can look for non-traditional credit. For example, if somebody has limited credit and it doesn't reflect on their credit report and their FICO score, but they can prove it, for example, they paid a loan to somebody. If they could show, say, canceled checks to show that they paid that loan on time, that can be used in a manual underwriting for non-traditional credit. Once again, F or FHA has mortgage insurance premiums, MIP, which is a lump sum paid up front, which people can finance. And they also have monthly mortgage insurance. The monthly mortgage insurance is 1.75% of the base loan amount borrowed. And then that's added to the base loan amount to come to your total loan amount. The monthly mortgage insurance is 0.85% calculated annually on the loan amount and then paid monthly. So divide that by 12 and it's paid monthly. FHA used to have some restrictions on what closing costs a borrower could pay. But in today's market, there is no longer any restriction on closing costs. FHA does not allow a second mortgage at time of closing to, to go behind their first trustee. They do allow buy downs also, whether it be a temporary buy down, say a 2 1 buy down, paying down the interest rate 2% the first year, 2%, 1% the second year. They do have buy downs, or you can discount or just negotiate your note rate paid about based upon whether you want to pay fees or don't want to pay prepaid interest and discount points. One more program to go over. One of the things that FHA does offer is if you want to refinance your FHA first mortgage, you can do what they call a streamlined refinance. And really what it is, very simple process. And what you have to do is show that you've made your payments on time for the last 12 months that you're reducing your interest rate, so it's going to reduce your monthly payment. With this, you, you, you're not required to do a credit report or an appraisal, but just show those two things, that you're paid on time and your rate is decreasing. What you do have to do, however, is get a mortgage rating to show that you've paid on time for the last 12 months. FHA is what they call a direct endorsement program where lenders can get certified to close under FHA guidelines. In the old days, and I'm a little guy, when we did FHA loans, we would package the FHA loan and take it down to our local FHA office. They'd underwrite the loan, give it back to us, and we'd close it. They don't do that anymore. If a company is direct endorsed, they can originate and fund their own FHA loans as long as they conform to FHA guidelines. Advantages of FHA loans, number one, 
100% gifts. If you want to get a gift from a family member, that's fine. Co-mortgages. If somebody wants to co-mortgage with you, that's fine also. They don't live in, have to live in the property, but they should be a family member. They're low down payment and they allow for lower credit scores. VA loans are guaranteed, or at least a portion of it, guaranteed by Department of Veteran Affairs. If somebody eligible for a VA loan has to be in service for at least 180 days or 90 days during wartime. And actually, everybody's eligible for the 90 day during wartime requirement because technically Desert Storm has never ended. To prove that you are eligible for a VA guaranteed loan, you'll get a certificate of eligibility. Um, also, people that may be eligible for VA loans are Coast Guard, National Guard. You can have a partial entitlement also. For example, if you bought a home in the past and used part of your entitlement, uh, you may have partial left also, so you can use part of that en en entitlement. Now, what you may have to do, since you don't have full entitlement, is, is put a, a down payment to offset the entitlement that you've already used. When you get a VA loan, you're going to have to get a an appraisal, and that's called a CRV, which is a Certificate of Reasonable Value. VA Certificate of Reasonable Values or appraisals are very similar to FHA in that the appraisers are looking for a standard, are looking for qualified property standards for that and they will call out things that need to be corrected. And one of the things you should remember about VA loans too is that they'll always require a termite report. So you have to get a termite report. A lot of other loans, including FHA and conventional loans, if they're not called out on the contract, you don't have to get the termite report. But in this case, if the VA appraiser comes out, number one, if he calls it out and says it looks like there's infestation, you'll have to get that report. But it's required also on a VA loan. VA loans also have a benefit. Their interest rates are very low. They have low interest rates, and also their guarantee fee is not that much. Um, you have to pay a guarantee fee to the Department of Veteran Affairs, but then again, two vets can can uh, finance that in their in their loan amount. The uh, income qualifications are similar to FHA. They're looking for around a 41%. And of course, that means your new payment, your bills, include your bills, and then divide by your gross month, monthly income should not exceed 41% of your gross monthly income. On a VA loan, you do have closing costs, but they cannot be included in your Department of Veterans Affairs loan. They do have a one-time financed fee, their guarantee fee, their, they call it their funding fee which today, if you're a first-time user, is 2.3%. So you would take your loan amount, say it's $300,000, multiply that by 2.3%, and then add it to your base amount, and that's your guarantee fee, which pays VA for guaranteeing the loan. Buy-downs you can do, and buy-downs, once again, are just prepaid interest, so you can buy down uh, the loan, whether it be temporary or discounted for the long term. So if you wanted to pay discount points and go from 3% to two and three quarters, you can do that also. With a VA loan, you can assume a VA loan, but the person assuming it has to qualify for it. But I don't recommend this if you're a veteran. If you let somebody assume your VA loan that's not a veteran, you lose that portion of your entitlement. So you can't go out and get a new VA loan. So if you are selling a piece of property, never consider letting somebody assume your VA loan. Let them come in with their own financing and take your eligibility and make it free so you can take it out and use it on another property. So you want to release that liability or do a novation so now your eligibility is free and you can buy another house. The VA does have a, an adjustable rate mortgage also. The most common one is the 5-1 arm. So once again, it's fixed for five years and then changes annually after that. They're actually pretty good programs, but as low as the fixed rate market is today, not a really viable product on the market. VA also has a streamlined refinance program where if you're refinancing your VA loan, 
with no cash out, you're just going for a rate and term refinance. Um, you can do a streamlined refinance, which requires no new appraisal and no credit report. If you want to do a full refinance, you can do a, even a cash out re, refinance and, and most lenders will go up to 100% of your loan to value. So you're going to have to get it appraised and you can go up to 100% of that appraised value. One thing new that you can do now with a VA loan, if you want to free up your entitlement, say you've got a VA loan on your property now and you want to buy another piece of property, but you want to keep your current property as a rental. What you could do is refinance your current property in a conventional loan and that'll free up your entitlement and your VA loan is free to go and buy another property. Calvin home loans are a little bit different. They're a different division in, entirely. With a CalVet loan, they are doing the lending. They'll fund the CalVet loan in uh, CalVet's name and issue the veteran a land contract. So legal ownership le is left with CalVet. Equitable ownership is left with the veteran, the buyer. To be eligible, um, all veterans are eligible, but you have to have 90 days active service. Here's something that's different than the normal VA. In a CalVet, the veteran has to be honorably discharged. And there are different buckets of money depending on when that veteran served. And their interest rates and down payments may be different. In some cases with a CalVet loan, you may have to pay a small down payment. Unmarried spouses of veterans killed in action also can be eligible for a CalVet loan. Their interest rates are low and very attractive to some veterans, but in the documents you, you can see that, or on the note, that the rate can change. However, I've been told in San Diego County it has, it has never changed. So what you get as you, at close of rescue is probably what you're going to remain having as an interest rate for the life of your loan. And then once you pay off your CalVet loan, then you paid off your land contract and you have legal and equitable ownership of the property. A couple of other things to mention about CalVet loans as far as possible opportunities. CalVet will do loans on manufactured homes and they'll do loans on manufactured homes in parks. So that can be an advantage. They do offer fixed and variable rate mortgages one of the things about CalVet loans that's a little bit different too is as you close you're going to have to get insurance you're going to have to get flood insurance and earthquake insurance and i believe they have a life insurance policy too specifically if the veteran dies then that policy is acted upon and the loan is paid off to CalVet <clears throat> 